Hello lovelies, how are you all doing today? I do hope you are well. Uh, I know some of you have been ill, injured recently. I hope you're all starting to feel a bit better. Um, as we head into the colder months, I'm saying that the sun is trying to peek through today. So we might have slight fluctuations in light, but it's most welcome because we've had a couple of days of yeah, quite a lot of rain, quite a bit more to come. However, the temperature's just come up a bit, so yay, I'm not cold. I've only got a cardi and a t-shirt on. Um, why is I talking about weather? Ah, oh, yes, yeah, so obviously, <laughs> losing track of thought straight away, the days are getting shorter. So at the moment, here we are at the end of October. Actually, the clock's about to change, aren't they? We're not quite there yet, but we... Yeah, we're losing the light about half past five. Give it another week, the clocks will change. It'll be half past four, quarter past four. So life is definitely transitioning into indoor, indoor life. That's okay. There's always something to do indoors. But never mind the daytime and the rain and not being in the garden, not being out and about. It's those evenings, evenings, the long, dark evenings, which historically, well, I hate. <laughs> However, um, I have tried to change my attitude towards winter in the recent years by saying, okay, you hate the dark, you hate the cold, you hate the damp, but you do love reading. And of course, that's winter, isn't it? That's my winter thing, reading. And I know, Loads of you are the same, uh, there'll be loads of you, not necessarily it's, it's the reading, but you'll be doing all sorts of other crafts, knitting, all sorts, and, <clears throat> sorry, trying new crafts. And on the subject of new crafts, I didn't mean to do that segue, yay, love a segue. Yeah, on the subject of new crafts, remember when I was, <coughs> excuse me, talking, <clears throat> This is a really good start, isn't it? I was talking uh, recently about corn dolls, corn dollies, or as a lot of people call it, wheat weaving these days. I'd really love to give it a go again. My grandma had shown me when I was a kid. She was an expert. She was an incredibly accomplished corn doll maker. And the reason I was thinking about it anyway was because, you know, further down the line, not, not right now, but further down the line when hopefully I'm gardening in a back garden rather than an allotment, it will free up some time. Uh, what am I going to do with that time? Less, less videos from the garden, need to generate some income. Let's have a go at straw doll making, corn doll making. And then this arrived in the post. <sighs> Yay! So this is from Eminem, who are two pals who were on my allotment site. They weren't there that long. I think, when did they start? 2019. And just really lovely people, my kind of people. And then they've fulfilled their dream by emigrating. They've moved to Norway. Mark was listening to the video, sort of listening as a podcast, and heard me talking about the straw dolls, was online looking for something else and came across this, so grabbed it for me. So I'm really, really grateful. It's such a lovely gift, and it's just that lovely, just that little connection still with friends who are now in Norway. But what I really loved about it was, I mean, literally, I took the paper parcel wrapper off, the minute I saw it, oh my goodness, whoosh, back in time. I remember it, I remember it from my grandma having it. So it was published in 1971, so I'd have been three, four or so. Um, and it was one of those books, so when we were little and we were staying down with them in their village at Langton in Dorset, the vast majority of the time, <laughs> We were feral. We were out all day just running feral. Oh, I loved it. But every now and again, there might be a big storm. They often had power cuts. Um, 
And if it was really, really inclement weather, you know, there's no playing out, there's no being feral today, what we're going to do. And, and this is the sort of thing. So either we'd be given demonstrations by grandma and, you know, taught to do it. But I also remember curling up. There were, there were two armchairs, that was it, in the little snug room. Um, otherwise, it was like the hardback chairs around the, around the table. But yeah, grandma's big squishy armchair getting in it and it felt huge, like it completely enveloped me. And just sitting, browsing, looking at the pictures of this book. And it was so funny because as soon as I got it out of the packet and started going through the pages, I could remember all the pictures. It was almost, I almost knew them by heart. I turned the pages, I knew what pictures were coming. Um, oh, look at that beautiful one on the back. So pretty. So yeah, it's that wonderful, it's a wonderful gift. It, it, it's a gift in three ways. It's a lovely thing from M&M, from Norway. Thank, I, don't, I think they bought it, it was an English person who was selling it, so that it's not come from Norway, but a lovely gift from them. A lovely kind of whoosh back in time to being a child and, um, and browsing it hour after hour. But also, of course, it's an instructional book. It's published by Dryad. I don't actually know if Dryad's still published. I've got some of the Dryad pamphlets up there, but they were the real kind of mainstay publishers for crafts in the UK. And not just the obvious ones like quilting or uh, macrame, weaving, but all sorts of, like every craft you can think of. So I shall really look forward, I'm going to put it there for now, safely. I'm really looking forward to having a go. It's not something that's going to happen quickly. Certainly it's not going to be something I'll be selling quickly. You know, I need to practice. <clears throat> Someone was asking me what I will do about getting straw. I will source that later on. For now, I'm going to use the art straws that we used to have in school, you know, the long... It's like a paper drinking straw, but it's it's much longer. Some people call them construction straws. Uh, so yes, to begin with, I'll practice with paper straws. And like I said, if they, you know, no matter how bad they are, I can put them in the recycling, I can put them in the compost bin. It's fine, just while I'm practicing. But yeah, what an, what an absolute peach of a gift through the post. I mean, I love getting books full stop, but to have a book, I'm sure some of you must have that as well, where, you know, quite often it's the ladybird books for us Brits, when you turn those pages of the illustrations and you can remember them, even though it's something from, you know, 50 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, maybe for some folks 60 years ago. But when we were really little, we probably looked at those images time and time and time and time again. Um, so yeah, it's lovely to have a book that's both useful for my future, but also gives me lovely memories of the past. Yay! Right, now I've got a couple of books to share with you. Um, <clears throat> hang on a sec. It's weird, I keep feeling like I'm getting something. But nothing transpires. I wish it would. I wish I found getting something. Just, just come on, hit me with it. <laughs> Let me have a couple of days of being uh, grotty and get over it and get on with things. But um, yeah, a little bit, uh, a little bit, never mind. Right, so when I went to Swanage, speaking of Swanage, I took three books with me. One which I'd started, two which I hadn't. I didn't read at all while I was there. I don't even think I read on the train journeys. I don't think I did on either train journey. The fact is, while I was there, I was too busy staring at the sea or, yeah, staring at the sea or staring at the sea a bit more. Um, so this is one of the ones I took with me um, and I, I showed it in one of the videos, I think. So first book today is called Portrait of a Murderer. A Christmas Crime Story by Anne Meredith. Now it's in this same um, series. I read one last winter 
this is how the spine looks and they've got this uniform style to them so block colours and you'll see the little British Library logo at the bottom and it's from the series called the British Library Crime Classics <laughs> it's quite a mouthful and I think I mean I, th I think there's dozens and dozens and dozens in this series but I think they're all, because it says like classics, I think they're all from the sort of the 10s, 20s, 30s, 40s. Uh, I don't know if they're all British. Just because it's British Library doesn't mean they're British, does it? I don't think. Um, so the reason I have this, or the reason it had a twin, <laughs> not saying but, but that I read last winter, is, I, I'll just mention this very briefly again. It, my sister confided in me a couple of years ago. She'd sent me a copy of the P.D. James Mistletoe Murders, which are six short stories, all murder stories, but Mistletoe Murders kind of set around Christmas. Um, I didn't read it for ages. I finally picked it up one day. Loved it. Rang her to say, I finally read this. I love it. Da, da, da. And that's when she confided to me. This, is, this has been, for her for a number of years, her guilty secret pleasure. At some point over Christmas, after Christmas Day, after kind of, you know, family and visitors have all left and everything's been tidied up, she takes a day out, she's off work, closes the door, turns the phone off, whatever it is, ignores everybody and curls up with a crime Book, a crime classic, not any of the modern ones, not the kind of really nasty modern ones, but one of these old fashioned, like Agatha Christie. Um, and I thought, oh, that's a great idea. That's a lovely once a year kind of treat self indulgence sort of thing. So I picked up, I picked up a couple actually. So last Christmas I sent, I sent my sister one and I sent my mum one and I had that one for myself and I really enjoyed it so then in just into the new year I saw this and picked it up for my sister for this Christmas I was kind of I thought if I buy her a book for Christmas she's got to last until Christmas you know what that didn't happen so instead of giving it to my sister for Christmas I've given it to myself for now I loved it. Uh, now look, it's not it, the ones I've read. They're not exact. They're not intellectually challenging. Let's say they're a really quick read. It's like an afternoon, a rainy afternoon read. When you know you're a bit restless, you don't know what to do. You're not really your concentration levels aren't maybe up to reading Dostoevsky or whatever. You think, oh, I'm, I'm, I need something to entertain me. I'm bored. What? Grab one of these British Library Crime classics. So this one, uh, it's set in 1930. Well, it was published in 1933. It's kind of set around then. And it's that good old fashioned premise where, where place is key, i.e. it's a place no one can leave from and no one can arrive to. So if we think of, you know, it's the locked room mystery isn't it where the country house Agatha Christie loved this as a as a device so if we think you know a small island that's maybe cut off at high tide a country house in the middle of nowhere a house that's cut off by snow there's a big snowball that's the one I read last winter the train that got stuck in the big snow drift and all the passengers ended up or the few passengers they end up in this abandoned house cut off by snow so that's the thing with this one now it does say Christmas crime story so the crime takes place right on the cusp of Christmas Eve into Christmas Day in the night however in terms of Christmas as a theme it's not strong it's not a strong theme at all you could read this at any time of year and it's a fun read in fact I think if you're reading it to get a bit Christmassy you're not going to feel it from this book <laughs> um, uh, very simple premise, um, a man, an elderly man, 70 plus, head of a family, has, I can't remember now, is it five or six grown up children, and they all come home to his house for Christmas, 
none of the grandkids are allowed. It's the grown-up children and their husbands' wives. And what's apparent straight away is they're all pretty vile people. <laughs> they're all... None of the characters are particularly nice. They're all greedy. They're all money grubbing. They all want a bit of money from the, you know, the head of that, the father figure. Everyone's, everyone's on the take basically. So, yeah, they're not attractive characters, but that's fine. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't spoil the enjoyment of the book. That's the whole premise. Another device she uses is, oh, here we go turning the page so within a chapter the, there are parts within each chapter or within the parts of the book and then you will see it'll say Ruth that's one of the kids so we know when we see that at the top it's blind binding this is what this is it's blind binding which is a, a type of a glued binding and they can fall apart that's a bit annoying didn't happen on the other one I read anyway yes yeah, so this so when we see that at the top of the page we know are oh, okay now these are the thoughts or the words of Ruth. So the, the, the opening section of the book, we've got that for each character. We get to know each character a little bit. And like I said, they're all pretty odious. And then as the book progresses, every, now, every time we see that heading, we know, ah, oh, it's a different person's thoughts. Now, as far as the crime goes, the crime happens quite early in the book and we know who done it. It's not a murder mystery. We, the reader, we know straight away who's done it. Where the fun of this book lies is when the murder happens. I have to be careful. I don't want to give too much away. I don't think I'm giving too much away. But the person what done it, he leaves a trail of clues intentionally but that would point to one of the other people. So we remember, we're back to that convention, the locked room convention. They're all contained in this one building. So the murderer is amongst them. And he leaves these clues to point to the other character. So it's an interesting read, as I was going to say, as the viewer, as the reader, because... I think what's interesting, so from the murderer's point of view, when, when the chapter headings are headed with the, I'll, I won't even give gender away, but when, when the murderer's name appears, and we know it's the murderer's thoughts, it's all about the psychology of, of their guilt and their worry. Am I giving it away? Am I, am I reacting? You know, when, the, when I'm asked a question, am I reacting in a guilty way? Oh, is it showing? Oh, so there's all that angst. Um, and I have to say, just very quickly, if you want to read a book that just so magnificently articulates guilt and what it does to a person's head, read Dostoevsky, oh, we're coming back to Dostoevsky, read Dostoevsky's Crime and Punishment. Because those first few chapters, the way Dostoevsky delineates that crushing guilt it's utterly sublime anyway back to Anne Meredith so it's very psychological um, and that's fun I think what's interesting is the reader though and this is what I reflected on for myself is when he's setting this kind of trap in a way to to hang it on someone else when he's setting them up for the fall Part of me is thinking, oh, God, I hope he gets away with it. Oh, it'd be great if he gets away with it. So it's quite, it's quite clever of Anne Meredith. She's kind of messing with my psychology because, of course, I don't want a murderer to get away with murder. But that's how I started to feel. Clever. But then towards the end, I changed and I was like, no, he can't get away with it. It's so unfair. You can't pin it on this other person that would be really unfair oh I hope it oh I just said hey sorry most of the characters are male that's why I blew that didn't I um anyway so yeah that's the that's the premise of the whole book is we know the murder gets done quite early on the murder gets done 
is that right? The murder happens. We know who the murderer is, and so the the rest of the book becomes about is he going to get away with it? Has he been clever enough where he's dropped in little clues purposefully in order to to point to this other character? Yeah, immense fun, immense fun. Like I said, a very quick, light, fluffy read. Um, but yeah, just immense fun. And now for something completely different, um, it's a bit more serious. So this wonderful book, an almost impossible thing, Fiona Davison. Uh, this was sent to me by Angie. Thank you, Angie. Um, this is a book by, let's hear, I can show you back because some people don't hear what I've said, Little Toller Books, I'm getting warm, um, Little Toller Books, what a wonderful press they are, a tiny independent press, I think they're based in Dorset, they, all their books are to do with rural affairs, horticulture, agriculture, they publish, you can see a whole tranche of them here, they publish sort of lost classics, so classics that have gone out of print, they're reprinting them and they're beautifully produced. Let me show you one of them. Oh, I'll show you one of the Claire Layton's, they're lovely. Oh, oh this maybe that was a second hand one, it's a bit scuffed. Um, so paperback, but really sturdy card with an end flap. Are they stitch bound or blind bound? Stitch bound. Oh, beautifully illustrated. This is, because this is Claire Layton. It's full of her illustrations. Really gorgeous quality, quality, both in terms of, in terms of the, the subject matter, but also in terms of the, you know, the sort of, how they publish them, how they, I'm getting boiling. The, the quality of the paper, the card, everything, just quality stuff. So they do, like I said, they do these kind of lost classics, out of print books, they bring back into print, but they also do modern writers, and that's what Fiona Davison is. She is, I think she's a researcher, oh, she's head of libraries and exhibitions at the RHS. So it's a really interesting book. Um, the subtitle, The Radical Lives of Britain's Pioneering Women Gardeners. There's our lasses <laughs> in their knickerbockers and flat hats because they had to dress like the boys. It's, in some ways, it's very, very niche. And that's another thing that Little Toller do brilliantly, really niche, obscure stuff. So on the one hand, it's very niche and you know verging and obscure but on the other hand it's an incredibly wide-ranging book in terms of this the the scope of the history because of the period that it deals with is it's a period of huge social change social upheaval and it's quite interesting as i was reading it i was thinking gosh how many how many times it's sort of we we can see society sort of waxing and waning with these thoughts of moments in time when we're sort of hearkening to the past and thinking, well, the past was better. Can we bring a bit of the past back? But also times of looking to the future and thinking the future can be better than the past. That That utter dichotomy of... We want progression, but we, but we want to keep what's good from the past. So in a nutshell, it covers the period, roughly speaking, 1890 to about 1920. The, the, a lot of the focus is in that sort of 1890 to 1900 period. And in essence, it's about women saying, we want to be able to go to horticultural school, college, apprenticeships, etc, etc, because we want to be gardeners. As not 
as in professional gardeners, not gardening in their own back garden. We want to be gardeners at the big country houses where the, the estate may employ 20 gardeners, you know, a head gardener and then all the individuals. We want to be employed at the gardens at Kew. We want to be employed in the orchid house. We want to be employed at myriad other botanical gardens. I think Edinburgh and anyway, we want to be employed as gardeners and therefore we want to be able to go to horticultural school to get the qualifications we need to get the job. And at the time, of course, there were no places for women uh, to study horticulture and there was pretty much no place for women working in gardens. So it's, it's all about the rise of these really small independent colleges which for the first time ever were taking in women students, um, getting them trained, great, and they were, and they were doing brilliantly. And then, my goodness, how did they get work afterwards? Rather than being quite simply um, a glorified lady's maid where you might work for a lady at her house, but you're in the garden just kind of tinkering, you know, doing a bit of deadheading. So that's the kind of gardening part of the book. But of course, it's against that backdrop of women's suffrage at the time. And a lot of the a lot of the women who were starting the colleges or who were prepared to give the women gardeners work afterwards. These are all um, <clears throat> how to put it. I was going to say the sort of more radical women of the age. Well, they were radical because they were going against the grain of what was considered acceptable for women and what wasn't. They were prepared to stick their necks out and say, "Why shouldn't women garden?" It was interesting for me to read because, I mean, I was getting a bit, I was getting a bit hot under the collar at times, thinking, God, this is so unfair. This is unfair. It's ridiculous. <laughs> Give me the vote. Um, so in a way, it was a, it was a tough read because of that, because I got upset. I got upset thinking, you know, how would, Ridiculous to my to my modern brain, how ridiculous that we treated women like that. And obviously we've come a long, long way. But the other thing with the book was that, so I kept jumping backwards and forwards. I was in the time I was in eighteen ninety or nineteen hundred, and then I was coming up to today and thinking, you know, how much we have changed and as a society in terms of what women are now allowed. To do, uh, I don't want to go on a feminist rant. I'm not a feminist ranter. I'm a human being who is part of a society. So I was thinking, yeah, we have come a long way. But then every now and again, I just think we've got so far to come. Still, you know, it, it's a it, when I finished that because I, I finished it a couple of weeks ago. That dreadful man, Lawrence Fox, was in the news again, and I don't really want to give him any airtime. But the way he spoke about that female journalist, and it's horrific. It's like, hang on a minute, it's the 21st century. So, yes, it's about women becoming gardeners, but that's, in a way, that's the, that's the launching point for the book. And we do get a lot of insight into that and how, uh, how for some women it was... It was a, a, a real moment of liberation and again I don't mean women's lib but it was a, a liberating moment because for example a woman opening her own nursery and employing another woman and even jointly owning the business it was one of very few opportunities for a woman to own her own business but also to live as a spinster, in other words, you know, an unmarried woman to live with another unmarried woman, it was considered acceptable if they were running their nursery business together. So firstly, you know, who the pressure's off, I don't have to get married, but also for, for gay women, it was, it was a way that gay women could actually be together. She does go into that quite, um, in, in quite some depth in the book. Yeah. 
uh, I made some notes actually. Let me quickly look at my notes because otherwise I'm going to waffle <laughs> and sound like a mad libber. Um, so this was another interesting thing. One of the big sort of issues for women at the time, um, and this was what was particularly galling, because I would fall into this category if I was living then, was this idea that women, sort of, you know, much over sort of 22, 23, 24, who were unmarried, were called surplus. <laughs> it, I mean, it's shocking to our modern ears, isn't it? We are surplus women. In other words, if we're not married and going to be popping out babies, we're surplus to requirement. We're useless. There is no use for us. And there were quite big campaigns, government backed, of how do we how do we deal with the surplus women? How do we get rid of them? And one of the ways they dreamed up to get rid of them was to send them to the colonies. So there's a lot of and it was another bit that got my back up, or you know, it, it's not a pretty it's not a pretty period of history so it touches on colonialism as well and in particular they were looking at uh, in in this book she looks at South Africa Australia but also in particular Canada so the idea was for these surplus women to they could go on uh, on courses they could take emigration classes where they would learn the skills of homesteading and they would go out to these unpopulated, of course they were populated, they had a native population, but the, I'm talking about the government of the day. They could go to these unpopulated countries to colonise them. And they were given lessons so that, for example, when they arrived, until they could find a husband and start breeding in order to populate, I mean, treated like cattle, sent there purely to breed to have more white british colonization of the countries um but taught lessons so that until they can find a husband over there because there were more men than women in other colonies uh they could at least they could go and char for someone they could go and work in you know they could go and clean for someone i mean it's it is extraordinary to our modern sensibilities isn't it so yeah it's not i think it's a really fascinating book it's not an easy read in terms of it kept getting my giddy go i felt so angry for these women the injustice of it the unfairness of it and also i think what needs to be noted this is very much talking about middle class women Working class women weren't considered surplus because they can be bunged in a factory and work. It's okay for working class women to work. They don't really count as women. They're just workers. That's fine. This was specifically about the middle and the upper classes. So there's a lot of class in there. So there's class in there. There's suffrage in there. Um, there's um, colonialism in there. And then, of course... The First World War happens and we get into that whole territory of, you know, these women, now they get a chance to prove themselves. You see, we told you we could do the work and now we're doing it. And, you know, you didn't want us before, but now you want us. Now there's no boys to do the job. Now you want us, don't you? Hmm? <laughs> Uh, and then, of course, with the end of the war, the women are once again shoved out of the jobs because you can't take a man's job. It's not a woman's place to, again, middle class woman, it's not a woman's place to steal a man's job. The man has the right to the job and the right to the earning potential because as a woman, you should be married and being looked after by a husband. <sighs> yeah, <laughs> it's just lots of random. Ah, but the other thing, to get slightly away from the ranty stuff, uh, and I don't mean any of that as a rant. It's, it's what the book covers. So it's very thought-provoking. Uh, and I did... 
<coughs> excuse me, I would read a bit and I'd shut the book for a minute and think, where are we at now? You know, where are, you know, on obviously, obviously women have it much, much, much better now. Uh, but one of the other things it talks about what, that, that comes up um, quite often, uh, it's the sort of the subject of agricultural reform. So we're talking about a period in which there has been a, a mass, mass human movement over the preceding hundred years or so of, of people away from the countryside and into the cities. So there are questions about, firstly, making cities nicer places to live. So we get into the garden city territory because with this massive population explosion in the cities, the cities couldn't cope. How can we make the cities more beautiful? But also with, with this huge drift of people away from the countryside, who's going to work the land? Who's going to grow all the food to feed all these people in the cities? Because now these people are in the cities, they're not growing their own food. And, and there were so many times I was reading that aspect of the book and I was thinking this has been echoed again and again and again. So we get to the First World War and it was the first kind of um, land girls. We need, you know, we need food production. We've been importing too much already, even back in 1914 we were importing too much. Right, we need to grow all our own food. We need to massively up the increase of, of our farming. And then of course we see that again during the Second World War. It's like, have we not learned anything? And again now when there are, you know, there's talk of like the wheat prices are gonna go through the roof because of the aggression on Ukraine. Those, all that wheat isn't gonna be able to get out of Ukraine. So it's interesting to, to see how there have been all these moments of history, we're saying the same thing. And, and there, were, there were moments in the book when she's talking about sort of also agricultural reform in terms of, you know, we're heading towards mechanisation and heading towards, you know, the huge farms. It's all about productivity, in never mind ecology, never mind people's jobs, never mind any of that. And it's being questioned even back in 1900. And here we are 120 odd years later, and we're questioning what are we doing with our farms in terms of biodiversity, in terms of supporting our farmers, you know, people in terms of having enough people to be out you know, picking fruit and vegetables, for goodness sakes. So, yeah, that was, it was really fascinating how so many things seem to be cyclical. We haven't learned. We're still talking about the same stuff. Will we ever learn? I don't know. Um, but, yeah, I think, like I said, I think it's a, it's, it's a pretty niche book, but really fascinating. I hope I've fascinated some of you enough to think, I, I'm going to ask my library to get a copy of this. There's about 12 chapters. The reason I'm mentioning the number of chapters... 12 chapters. Uh, and there are there are a few sort of um, illustrations throughout. Sort of photos, illustrations from um, periodicals, journals of the time. I love that because it really helps to, you know, bring it all to life. I lost my train of thought. Yeah, I hope... I hope I haven't put folk off having a go because, yeah, it did make me <laughs> grumpy. Not with the book and not with her writing, but ew, with the stuff. Oh, yeah, the chapters. The reason I'm mentioning that, there's 12 chapters. I can't remember whether it was chapter 3 and 4 or chapter 4 and 5. For me, it dipped a little bit. I don't know whether that was... It may have been my concentration at the time, I'm not sure. But it suddenly felt a bit list-like and a bit family tree. Oh, she was the daughter of such and such. And the such and such had married such and such. And their cousins had had the stately home of Durda. And they'd employed this garden. And it, it just, yeah, it dipped. It felt a little bit list-like. And I lost the human story in it for a while. But then it picks up again. 
and go I I ran full full tilt to the end. Uh, couldn't put it down after that. It becomes more human and uh, yeah. I can't describe it any other way. It just did, like I said, it felt a bit like a list, and I, I didn't care about all of all of the genealogy and what have you. I just wanted to know about the individual person, and it got back to that. And like I said, then it was a romp right to the end. Couldn't put it down. Brilliant. Thank you, Fiona Davison. Thank you, Little Toller Books, and thank you, more importantly to Angela for getting this to me. I shall keep that. I will lend it out to any friend who shows an interest in it, but like I said, it might be a bit niche. Right, my lovelies, I think I've been nattering on for ages enough. I've got another two coming up, another two books coming up. Um, yeah, I can't wait to share those with you. But oh, that's enough book chat for today, I think, isn't it? So, happy happy kind of prepping for winter with getting some nice books in maybe that one because it's so newly published you might need to ask your library to get it in for you they may not have had it in yet um happy stocking up on all your craft <laughs> i can't speak the craft supplies that you may be needing over this winter or maybe you don't need to stock up. Maybe what you need to do is go all around the house and look in all your nooks and crannies and realise, actually, I've got a hundred balls of yarn scattered all over the place. I do not need to buy any more yarn for this winter. But anyway, yeah, happy getting ready for cosy winter nights on the settee, in your armchair, wherever it is, either with a book or your craft. <gasps> I've already started <laughs> with the books. Until next time, lovelies, please be well. Cheerio.